Okay, so let's talk. I want to talk a little bit about analog cable, and um, I'm going to write some examples on the board, and then I'll show you the visuals. And then it's basically analog cable versus digital cable. So, what do you think the requirement is for analog cable versus digital cable? Like, what what are we really talking about? I say analog cable versus digital cable or digital connectors. What are the, what's one transmitting versus the other? I said analog cable transmits. Yeah, okay, so which one's electrical? Analog. Analog, right? So the analog signals carry electrical energy, or electricity, if we just get down to it. And digital carries what? Binary. Binary. Now, obviously, here's, here's where the catch, here, it, it sounds really simple, but this is where people get confused, okay? If I have a digital cable and a digital signal coming from one device, am I allowed to connect it to an analog device like that, that digital cable to an analog device? Or do I have to only connect to a digital device? Don't you have some things that can do both? Um, there's something in the book that we were talking about. It was, was it AES? That does, or SPDIF, that does both or something like that? Yes, well, the, yes, absolutely. And actually, you could run, so AES, uh, okay, so hold on to that thought. When I'm sending signal from a digital device and I'm putting it down a digital cable, what am I allowed to connect it to from there? And that's the big kicker, because we'll go back to that, because AES and SPDIF we're going to talk about. Big thing is, is it's just like talking a language, okay? If you send it from a digital device, it has to be connected to a digital device if it's supposed to be running down a digital line. Follow me? The, the reason that it's so confusing is because SPDIF and AES-CBU can do both only because of the fact that the cable itself, this cable, which is a light cable, can be used as an as a AES-CBU cable, which means it can also produce and send digital information down the line, even though it's not technically officially 100% through and through digital cable. The reason why is because they found a way to transmit binary information down the line. Kind of interesting. Right? Um, let me, uh, so let me categorize this. Uh, and that's why you may have to kind of keep track of how these work. So analog in terms of the line. XLR, quarter inch, uh, TS or TRS, RCA. Coax. Now, coax can also be digital. You probably know this by one mean. What do you think? Yeah, digital cable. Essentially, yeah, digital cable. Um, so technically, the really interesting part about this is in the cable types that you can still use XLR for digital. You can't use the quarter inch TRS, but you can use RCA and you can use coax. Well, oh, actually it's coaxial, Oops, sorry. The big thing here is you use XLR for AES EBU, which really stands for the uh, Audio Engineering Society of uh, the European Broadcast Union. Like, right, kind of a snooze, but so most people call it AES EBU. You can use RCA for something called SPDIF, Sony Philips Digital Interface. The weird part about this, and of course, you know, there are uses for coax and digital. The weird part about this is that there's one particular uh, cable type that it is essentially 100% through and through digital. And it, it is uh, optical. Optical is also known as uh, fiber or toss link. Essentially, they're all, they're all the same. Um, TIDF, uh, you probably read that in the book. It's essentially an optical option as well. The ones that we really typically focus on a lot are um, 
the optical fiber uh, fiber optics toss link a lot of times, and then AES CBU. So here's the, the real kicker here. SPDIF and AES CBU, essentially this is this is the balanced pro level digital connection. This one over here in RCA land is the unbalanced consumer level. And then optical is a pro, TIDF is a pro, these are pro balanced. And then I think I left, what did we know? Solar RCA, coax, optical, oh, Ethernet, Cat5. I mean, and we also have DB25 connectors, which is, you know, like analog large format multi-pin breakouts. Um, but it's important to kind of get a gauge of which ones are supposed to be for which. You know, so like on the back of this device. Actually, I'll use it. You guys still wait? <laughs> Barely. All right, on the back of this device. We have quarter inch analog, quarter inch analog, and then over here we have XLR analog, and then digital stereo. This is coaxial, this is actually RCA. So these are RCA connectors for digital. But down here we have optical. So another set of digital. And then we have, of course, MIDI. You know, and then there's like a host link if we want to run a remote control. And notice over here it says ADAT optical. And that's where that um, digital audio tape, uh, Alesis digital audio tape uh, stuff comes from, but it really is uh, just a digital fiber optic line. Now here's what's interesting. You can technically send SPDIF in certain cases on certain devices. You could send what's known as SPDIF in a protocol stance down optical lines. So where SPDIF and AES EBU are a protocol for digital, you know, these are the lines that carry them. Does that make sense? Where there's not, in, there isn't really such a thing in the analog realm, it's just line input, mic input. You know, where these are kind of those, those kinds of uh, information. And the, these are all, I mean, in reality, these were all just standardizations designed for the purpose of digital transmission. You know, so um, once they standardize this, it's just kind of like USB. You know, when they standardize USB, everybody gets on board and makes the USB input outputs. Inputs. Um, you know, so that's. So AES, EBU, and SPDIF, things like that are protocols. Yes. For how to do specific things. Exactly. Okay, so it's not like a cable or a piece of software. Or yeah, exactly. So it's like a, it's essentially it's a built-in protocol. Uh, and like in this one, you know, this one has uh, SPDIF right here. This is the digital SPDIF section and you know there's a spit of car designed to uh, translate the binary information as it goes into the device so you know I mean it, it literally is just basically like uh, like you know uh, any kind of basic uh, protocol designed as a standard for the use of devices so like the 002 and that's what's really interesting I mean if you were to look at these if I can manage to get this back around the other way We talked about this guy, it was the last week, I think it was. Pop this rack out. Well, let me grab my flashlight again. Back here in the back, down at the bottom, optical, spit it. And then word clock, of course, is going down analog coax. Uh, and then there's optical stuff up here. You know, but again, there's your digital transmission. Now, one thing that the book should have highlighted and is very important for you to know in terms of the review, so hint, hint, review. Optical cables. Optical cables transmit eight channels. And optical cables transmit eight channels one way. Okay? So eight channels sent one way. 
which means if I want to send it one way and have it returned another way, I need two gigs. Follow me there? So optimal can transmit eight channels one way at the same time. Can, uh, at the same time, uh, you can actually transmit word clock. Sync. So a lot of these are designed to do that. A lot of these, uh, a lot of your digital devices are, are designed to carry the clock. AESEBU And it's really interesting how this, this one's set up uh, with, with this uh, coaxial spitif. AESEBU and spitif. Both of these guys transmit two channels. One way. The reason that's so important is because when you take a spit channel, you plug in one channel, like one cable, and it's two channels. And that's the difference between like in the connectivity, because normally when you run an XLR standard, it's just running one channel. But it's because in the digital realm, this is really actually quite cool. In the digital realm, there's there are low-level transmissions. So in the digital realm, the, the need for uh, shielding and the need for blocking out noise isn't there. So when a digital, when an XLR is being used in an AES EBU format, it's not sending a duplicate of the signal and inverting the phase to reduce noise. Instead, it's literally sent using one of the conductors to send, another conductor to receive, and another conductor to ground. And that's it. So optical is an actual physical cable, right? Yes. Okay. I'm confused because you're comparing optical with the protocol. Yeah, optical, okay, so optical essentially, uh, yeah, because you're talking about, oh, I see, because you're talking about these. Optical uses, and that's how, it's interesting how this, uh, optical uses protocol known as ADAT, uh, oh, who was, who's, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. it's no, it's literally just known as ADAT optical. Sorry, is the protocol. Okay. ADAT optical is the protocol. Optical cables are the cables. So, so yeah, they, they literally, I'm sorry, I apologize, because they, they kind of do kind of easily run one into another. ADAT is the protocol developed cr crazily enough in the 80s. Yeah, light pipe, essentially. A lot of times we know it as light pipe or optical, uh, but ADAT, ADAT optical is the, the protocol. And anytime you see in an audio interface ADAT, it's, it's always carrying the brand that, uh, that icon, ADAT optical logo. You know, so that one has them uh, in the back of those devices. And all the stuff in, in the studio has access to that as well. So yeah, there's a, it's an eight channel, one way uh, word clock system uh, that actually transmits eight channels of audio. What I like about ADAT optical is that technically with an ADAT optical, and you saw how thin these lines were, there was one, I don't know if it's still sitting in the back. You could technically run several hundred feet of these You could technically run several hundred feet of ADAT optical because it's at a low level transmission. It won't have any particular issues uh, with interference, and you can send eight channels. Now, the new, the new, and I guess if you want to, the, the, I don't think the book, did the book talk about Dante? Okay, yeah, I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't think it did. It's such a new thing. Dante essentially uh, uses Ethernet. It's not, this isn't going to be on the exam, though, because it's such a new protocol. Dante essentially uses, uh, uses Ethernet um, to transmit its lines. Uh, with an Ethernet, you could technically take up to, let's see, 16. Or the most I've seen right now as it stands are 24 channels down one line. Um, they make a lot of these breakout boxes. Uh, I know you know what a channel snake is. But a channel snake, like these, these boxes kind of are almost like a channel snake. Uh, it, this is essentially, in the, it's a studio panel because we're used to seeing this as a studio panel. But a channel snake essentially is anytime you have a bundle of cables, if you were to look at the actual uh, cable itself, it's just one cable. 
Well, that one cable is going to be pretty thick because it's using full gauge, you know, um, uh, cables running down as a combination. But you guys, if you're familiar with an Ethernet line, they're really quite small. And so Dante is the new kind of uh, thing where they'll run it as a digital protocol all the way to a box. It has to have a digital interface in order to transition it back to analog audio, but they'll literally be able to build a whole hub that you can just connect with Ethernet and then, you know, uh, transmit this information. The benefit of Ethernet is that it's low level transmissions, it's super low cost to find Ethernet lines that are long. Um, you can run super long runs of them. Um, the downsides to Ethernet, they're cheap. They don't, they don't over under or roll very well. Uh, and, and unfortunately they break a lot. Um, so that's kind of one of the big catch 22s to using the Dante systems. Um, but a lot of times, if you, like we have Dante set up here in the studio, uh, a lot of times if it's in a fixed position, it's not gonna move, it's not a huge issue. Actually, can you uncap that for a second? Okay, well, did you guys get all that? Uh, what you see on screen is, there's some RCA, I'll point them out. Okay, RCA, this is a, a coax cable, uh, a little bit different with the connector types. And then um, this is your standard coax cable that you guys are pretty familiar with. But if we were to go look at XLR, there's this. You guys are familiar with that. Oop. <laughs> These are Toslink connectors. And I don't know if they have any heavy duty ones in here. They do make heavy duty ones. These are also a lot of times like super cheap looking. I had somebody give me one one time that was like 50 footer and I, I loved it. I, was, I used it all the time and then it broke and I had to go buy one and a 50 footer was like almost 100 bucks. So um, even though they look super cheap and plastic, um, if we were to look at AES EBU, notice technically they're all the same kind of lines, but if I type in AES EBU jack, What it what you have to see in order for an AES EBU to be an AES EBU versus a standard XLR is it actually has to say that it's a digital output. I don't know if you can see this one up close. Oops. Oh yeah, here we go. So notice, analog, here are analog input, output. Over here, digital, AES, EBU, in and out. Notice it's a single cable each way, right? So the maximum channel capacity you could have on an AES, EBU was how much? Maximum channel capacity. 80. On the AES, EBU. Oh, two. Two, yeah. Same thing with SPIDA, two. Um, it's interesting how they do use, uh, one of the studios I, I work with uses AES EBU, and what they do is, and uh, of course this one's, which one is this? This is, sorry, I wanted to see what version task came this was. Oh yeah, this is the same thing. Although, wow, that's interesting. I've not seen this model before. What they do a lot of times is they'll, they'll buy, notice this is, this is a simple two-channel preamp. You can tell because it says in channel one, channel two. Uh, but I, you know, if I just cheated because I looked at it and it says HD mic preamp, right? And it's a simple two channel preamp because you can see the gain knobs. But what they'll do is a large, uh, higher end studios like these, smaller studios can do this too. You'll go buy like a $2,000 preamp, digital preamp that only has two channels. And what it's really good at are you know handling anything that only requires one input or two 
versus some that require 10. So you could use a lot of vocals and guitars and things like that. And what you'll do is you'll send, the, you'll use the preamp as the input, and instead of sending it from the preamp analog to the con to the uh, inputs of the of the digital workstation, you're going to send it AES EBU, so that the clock sync is locked to it. And then what they'll also do is um, in the in large format studios, we don't bounce out. Any of you who use DAW software and are used to bounce out exports, we don't do that on the high end studios. A lot of times in a high end studio, what you do is a reprint, and you would literally record back into the system. And what that requires is it re if you're doing it analog, it requires you to actually patch an output back into an input. And the reason it's done like that is because you're, when you're mixing on a large format console, you're, gonna, you're mixing out of the box instead of in the box in Pro Tools. You're mixing on a physical device or running through a bunch of external gear and you have to be able to route it back. So the cleanest way to do it is to send it back, uh, send it out digital and, uh, you know, or send it out to the console and send it back into the console through a nice high-end high HD preamp that's going to have essentially the highest level of quality you can get on those two channels. And you pump that back in digitally back into the DAW. So that's kind of how that works. Uh, so I think that handled our... Um, really quick question on the digital cable again. Yes. So the digital cable is like the same as the digital cable. Well, specifically like for light... Are you talking about for lighting? Yeah, well, I mean, lighting is designed for... Uh, the data lines are designed for DMX... To, to use uh, more than your standard 3-pin. In most cases, you'll see 5, but you, you'd even see DMX run a 7. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really awkward when you, when you run into one, but it's, it's protocol that's designed specifically for the controller um, because what the, you know, the controller is going to hit the, the actual hub that's producing um, you know, the, the power for the system or whatnot. You can, though, run XLR as data jumpers once you hit the breakout. So, like, uh, a lot of times in a, in a lighting system, you'll run a 5-pin DMX line from the controller to the main uh, power hub on stage. And then from there, you can actually route from there. You can either do Silco lines or you can do XLR lines direct to, to the lighting uh, data points themselves. So they make a lot of the PAR64 cans, yeah. your standard lighting can in both LED and the old school uh, standard bulbs. And they, they make those essentially with the XLR input for their data line. And it's only because on their given channels, they're, they're not required to have a 5-pin. Okay. But the 5 pins designed as a, the communication so to... Like moving line from like smart instruments, you have to have that 5-pin. Yeah, well, and, it's, yeah, it's, and essentially it's designed to send more, more information than is needed by the dumb cans, but, but stuff that can be very important for moving fixtures, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and it's interesting because that, even that's moving to Cat5 right now. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, again, it's just because of the longer runs. DMX is kind of frustrating because if you were using standard XLR, the price point would be very low. But because you're using a specialty five pin, yeah. it's it's kind of costly to get like 200 foot runs of that, and you can't run it down the snake, the channel snake, or anything. You know, so um, and it really is only sending data. You know, so that's what's interesting. Yeah, you have to run another line, like a completely separate line for the model. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that's kind of the catch-22 with that, but... Um, okay, let's take this from the top, and I'll ask you guys, and you can raise your hand and let me know anything that you feel stuck on, and... Oh, I was already in it. And I will jump all over the place to help you. Okay? So, you guys hopefully are familiar with frequency, frequency and amplitude, so let's just talk about it. Frequency is... Okay, frequency is equivalent to the pitch, and it specifically states like like what in in that whole pitch. Uh, well, let's not go to pitch. What else does it do in our range? Like, how do we measure it? Decibels? Is it decibels? No, hertz. Hertz. Okay. So frequencies, frequency, of course, uh, and maybe you know what? Only because half the class is missing, I might just type this into a doc. Not that I, not that I just. Not that I really want to des desperately share it with people as a doc, but because I want you to actually be able to see it on screen instead of me writing it on the board. <laughs> and, them not, and them going, oh, well, I don't know what he's writing on the board at all, so let me just do that real quick. But this doesn't, let me just say this. This, this doesn't say it all. 
This doesn't necessarily say at all uh, what I put on here. There may still be more information in regards to, it, to how it needs to be uh, handled, but frequency is equal to pitch. It is measured in, right? It's measured in hertz. And it resembles what per what? Yeah, uh, per almost there. Per second, per second okay? So I'm going to save this as a midterm review with notes. Yeah, cycles per second, okay? And that these are all, um, oops. This is what I love about this whole thing. There's so many equivalencies here. Okay, so amplitude is, oh, and also, I'm sorry. And also, cycles per second, because of that, it's also equivalent to the length of the wave, right? Where amplitude is volume, right? Measured in decibels. And it is the height of the wave. So when you're looking at waves, when you're actually looking at waves, that's what that is. Here, let me zoom this in so you're not squinting. Is that okay for you guys? So, um, you know, the, those are really, I mean, those are the big keys for those guys. There's really not much else to say except for the fact that if you understand that, oh, I'm sorry, at the end you don't see length of the wave. Uh, if you understand this well enough, it helps you make determinations based upon your environment. So when I say, you know, in this room, if I place a mic all the way across the room, it will pick up some things successfully, right? But more than likely, you know, uh, that microphone more than likely will pick up what kind of frequencies? Yeah, in most cases, high. And, and, and so we measure that. Well, I'll also say this. This isn't, it's not on the exam, but this is super important information for you. Remember that when we look at the frequencies and we look at the frequency levels and we look at the pitch, as the frequency level gets higher, as the frequency gets higher, it becomes more directional. As the frequency gets lower, it becomes more what? Yeah, omnidirectional. Exactly. And so, you know, uh, that's where it you know, when you're like moving microphones further away from a source, sometimes you end up in a position where you get so far away that the low end doesn't seem as dominant, but it's because the low end is responsible for a 360 degree radius of emission, where the high frequencies are only responsible for very directional, you know what I mean, which is why when I talk to you, I don't sound, my voice doesn't have as much depth as it would if I was like right on you, right? Uh, but the high frequencies are still pretty, pretty solid. Uh, Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's really, it's emitting, it's resounding off of you and it's emitting in that 360. The interesting part about it though is, is uh, again, back to the human hearing uh, abilities. We weren't designed to have really super low frequencies because the, the, we, we were literally designed, our ear is, a, is essentially a transducer, right? And it's translating acoustical energy into neurons, which our brain will filter out and make decisions on. And it's specifically designed to pick up a certain range of frequencies. And if it wasn't so, our ears would either have to be very large or very small. Does that make sense? If it wanted to have more focus on high frequencies, we'd have really small ears. If it wanted to have more focus on very low frequencies, it would have what? We'd have huge ears, right? Remembering that the, those transducer sizes do something, right? They mean something, how they emit, how they respond, how they pick up. That's kind of why you need this, this, those kinds of things. Well, that, the, the problem is is that the elephant ear should technically pick up better low end, but it's not, it won't be drastic because if you go back down to the, to, it's not the size of the lobe, it's the size of the canal. Okay. You know what I mean? Which my assumption is it's probably something more along this lines or maybe a little bigger, but it's not like it's like this big <laughs> compared to ours, right? There's, it's, uh, you know, so there's some food for thought. Um, but next time I see an elephant, I will totally ask him. 
Uh, Mike Specs. Let's talk about some Mike Specs. Uh, you know, um, polar patterns, max SPL. I think sensitivity got lost. Where is it? It's over here somewhere. Oh, and of course, this is SPDIF, not SPDIG. Uh, oh yeah, mic sensitivity and frequency response ended up all the way over here. I apologize. You might want to write notate next to these that these are mic elements. So what's a polar pattern? Kind of. Well, the polar okay. The polar patterns. I'm sorry. I should say, and I think add this to this. You should. I would add this pickup pattern because technically a, the pickup pattern is the, the, the style. Cardioid. What else do we have? I mentioned one before. I just said the word when we were talking about subfrequencies. Omnidirectional. Omnidirectional. Good job. What else do we got? <laughs> that's, a, that's more of a cardioid. What else do we got? Super cardioid. Super cardioid. Good job. What else? Oops, I keep forgetting that oid. Hypercardioid. These are essentially just modifications to the cardioid uh, design uh, that have a little more or less rejection on the sides and a little tighter response uh, in, towards the back. Uh, one more. Yes, bidirectional. Bidirectional is also known as... Sorry, I'll zoom out so you can see that a little better. What's bidirectional also known as? Figure eight. Good job, bud. Figure eight. Now, when it comes to polar patterns, it's important to note that polar patterns um, essentially are specifically talking about the 360 degree, degree representation. So I'm going to put that here. It's a 360 representation of the pickup pattern itself. All right, so what's max SPL? It's a threshold. Okay, there's, there's an important part about threshold. What about it? What did somebody say? Anybody? Sound pressure. So, okay, sound pressure level. What's max SPL in regards to mic specs? Yes. Essentially, it's the, it's, it's the threshold of distortion. Highest sound pressure that the mic can withstand. I'll just put mic can withstand. Not bad, right? Okay, so that's that's kind of an interesting thing. So like the polar or the polar pattern is going to decide how the the figure of the the shape of the mic is going to to, to look. Um, the max SPL tells us when it will distort. What did the sensitivity do for us? It's way down here at the bottom. It is, I'm just going to put this in here. It essentially is the dynamic response Essentially it's how well the microphone represents dynamics. Now the frequency response of course is it's essentially the frequency response essentially is how well the the mic represents what? Frequencies. Yeah, frequencies. Yeah, essentially how well it, re, it the mic represents different frequencies. In some instances you want it to respond unnaturally. In some instances, you want it to be really natural. Uh, an instance that um, you want to be unnatural is the kick drum. 
for example, because a kick drum doesn't sound like a kick drum when you hear it in a recording. It sounds big, it sounds huge, you know, it's got all this power, but if I go play it in there and you listen to it in this room, it's going to kind of sound flat, not very, sub, there's no sub, like when I play that, your bottom doesn't vibrate, but when you play it in your car, it does, you know what I mean? Like, so it's a little unnatural in terms of its frequency response, um, but it's designed that way, and that's something you would have to look at. Uh, oh, one other thing here is, uh, let's talk about mic types. Where did I put those mic specs? Mic specs, mic specs, mic specs. Oh, here they are. Mic types. What do we got? Dynamic. Dynamic. What else? Ribbon. Ribbon. What else? Condenser. Condenser. One of these has two types. Which one is it? Yep, condensers, small and large. Let's talk about these guys. Which out of the three, which one of these is most sensitive? Fragile. The ribbon. The ribbon. Out of the three, which one of these is most robust? Dynamic. Dynamic. Which one of these has the highest max SPL, typically? Dynamic. Which one of these ends up having typically the fullest frequency response? Technically, technically in most cases, it's, it's actually the ribbon, but because of its fragility, most people choose the condenser over it. Um, between a condenser small and condenser large, what's the difference? I, okay, I want to record some symbols, large or small? small? Small. And if you turn around, you can see the drum set is set up on the overheads, up hanging up high. Those are small diaphragm condensers. Right, I want to pick up, uh, I want to record a cello, large or small? Large, and actually if you had both, I'd put, I'd aim the, the, the uh, I'd use a small, aim it up top at the strings, use a large, aim it down low where the body is, and kind of blend a little bit, bit of both. But yeah, so essentially you're, you're understanding, you know, the, the difference in the condensers. You remember when we recorded the piano and I moved the uh, mics around, kind of tried different positions. It will also determine whether you're using a large or small, what position you should be in based upon what you know about the frequencies that you're trying to capture. You know, so that's kind of something to keep in mind. Ribbons have a, have a really interesting f uh, situation. The ribbons are fixed on a specific uh, pickup pattern. What is it? You remember? Ribbon mics. Of a very specific pickup pattern where the condenser mics could be all types. Bi yes, bi directional. Exactly. So the ribbon mic has the ability to, uh, or I should say, not doesn't have the ability. Essentially, it, it, it's designed that way to be a bi directional mic. What was it that you said? Uh, the ribbon's actually better at it, but people pick the condenser over it. The full frequency response. Yeah. Well, you have to remember that back in the day, because ribbons are the old vintage ribbons carry a different signal to noise ratio. You know, so they're not they're not as efficient, even though they sound better. Kind of a catch twenty two. You said the dynamic or more robust. Yes. What does that mean again? Like you could throw it from the top of a building and you could oh. pick it up and still use it. Oh. <laughs> Which is, which is, if you were to go online, that was like, that's the, the sure drop mic test is a thing. It's like an actual thing. I mean, it is, yeah, I mean, in reality, you could, you could easily just, you know, slam that thing against the wall and keep on going. Well, and the one benefit it has is there's a gap between the capsule top and the actual diaphragm of the mic. So in most cases, that, that gap allows you that much grace room for when it has an impact. And because the capsule sizes are so small, it's really difficult to have a dent even larger than that. So you can just twist off the cap, the cap put a new one on, good to, good to go. About 15 bucks. It's a quick fix. Uh, dither. Oh, that's uh, white noise that you add. Yes, do you remember why? Um, oh, I like this. I'm going to put what you put. I like that. Essentially, well, I should say this. It's randomized noise, but but 
but just to kind of help you, but it, essentially it's white. White noise is randomized noise, but but uh, essentially it, it kind of helps you kind of fill in how this works. And what it's used for is it's to replace um, the audible difference or our shield or mask. Maybe mask is a better word. The audible difference from changing your dynamic resolution from 24 bits to 16. Oops, what did I spell wrong? Dynamic, oh, depth. Oh, so like when you're transferring from analog to digital? Uh, not, no, not necessarily. When you're transferring from 24 bit to 16 bit in, in, the, in, digital, the, digital in the digital domain, yeah. So when you're going to 16 bit, is that just, why is that better than 24 bit? Well, it's not, it's not. It's just that in, in most force mediums, see, and that's interesting that you said that. CDs are fixed at 16-bit, and that was, that was the majority of the reason why we needed it. Now, the majority of the, like I said, you, when you guys get iTunes uh, mastered for iTunes, you're able to get a 24-bit file, um, but in most cases, 16, a lot of times they'll still use 16, um, because, you know, 16, you're not using, losing that much in terms of dynamic resolution unless it's like an orchestra or something that has a lot, that requires a lot of dynamic range. But um, the, the reason why we were doing it in the first place was because of CD. But the really interesting part about what you said is when do you transfer out back to analog? Uh, and the interesting answer to that question is not until you play your digital file through some speakers. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the file still stays digital. And when it was burned on CD, it's still digital, right? Uh, only when it was uh, essentially melded to vinyl is there some sort of analog representation or tape where there's magnetics and there's an analog representation, you know, but it still has to go through this transfer process, you know, so it's really interesting how that works out in the modern day. It'll stay digital all the way to the end, uh, you know, and, and it only technically becomes analog when you play it through your phone or when you play, you know, when you actually go back out to speakers, which is crazy. Is that if you like are plugging it into like an auxiliary port and that's when it's transferred analog? So if you're using like Google Chromecast or something and you're casting it to your speakers, does it still have to go to analog? Okay. Yeah, if you're cast, well, it depends on how the cast is designed. Um, that's a great question, actually, because technically, if you're like if you were to Google Cast or Chromecast on a digital media, like the actual Chromecast device, which has uh, an HDMI output, mm -hmm. HDMI is digital. So it doesn't even transition into analog until it hits the speakers yet again. Okay. Does that make sense? So it's like, like or the speakers aren't even the transition. It's the power amp that, that's right before. There's, essentially, there should be some sort of encoder right before the amp, and then there's the speaker so output. Like the very last thing yeah, it. yeah. It's, it's, it's way down at the end of the chain. Uh, signal to noise ratio we did. Uh, yes. Oh yeah, because the randomization isn't applied. It's not like the it's it's not like we're filling in the extra eight bits. Like it's not like we're taking the place of the eight, extra eight bits. What we're doing instead is we're you know they built an algorithm where you add the white noise on top of the sixteen bits. But by adding the white noise, it subdues the amount of uh, difference between the resolutions. Or it kind of by adding a little bit of a noise floor, it kind of takes away from the focal point of there being a resolution change. Um, so again, it's still kind of only masking it. it you would still kind of hear a difference. Uh, and in some of the algorithm types, what they try to do is they try to, when the dither comes down, they pick the significant bits that are, are being used as the ones that we keep versus just taking any of the 16. It's just going to, it's going to take the ones that are being used at any given time in, in the snapshot or framework as the samples pass by which is really kind of a little brainy, like that's very scientific how it's done, but yeah, I mean, you're not really, 
you, at the end of the day, it's the device is only going to play back 16 bits, so the dither effect has to uh, add noise inside of those 16 bits. If it threw it anywhere else, they would not be noticeable, or they, would, or they wouldn't do anything. Um, you guys know what hertz is because it's the measurement of uh, frequency, and the decibel is the measurement of yeah amplitude. Uh, ADAT light pipe toss link uh, we talked about, which I uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna I'll add optical so that you, no one's confused. Uh, phase we talked about phase today because we were talking about the cable types, but let's talk about phase. What what's uh what's the deal with phase? Like in phase versus out of phase? Yeah. Um so in phase the waveforms match up perfectly. Okay. Okay. What I'm gonna put is using more what occurs when using more than one mic on a source and just what you said, in phase allows waveforms to align and work together. We're out of phase creates cancellation due to the waveform being out of sync. Do you guys remember how we could tell audibly? How can we tell if it's out, if it's out of phase? Say it again. Okay, it, the bigger thing is, is you lose the low end. It's, it's actually not as muffled. That there's one thing about it, though. What, what was it? When out of phase, you lose low end, and what else? Oops. And the high frequencies sound swishy. The best. They really, literally, literally will. Kind of like that. That kind of sound. Sorry, I know that's a lot of stuff, but we're almost there. You guys want to take a break? It's, it's four twelve. We're okay. Huh? Yeah, well, you know what? Let's just let's take a quick five, and then we'll jump back in. All right, you guys okay? Hanging in there, Dylan.
All right, looks like we're almost pretty much all here. Okay, so let's keep going. So gain, what did, what was our gain? Essentially, what is gain? What does it do? Oh, gee. Part of the preamp. That applies level to the mic. Pretty simple, right? So is gain like an actual like physical piece of something? Yeah, so a lot of times it's like it 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 uh, it's an actual device that when they work on it, it's technically an amp, okay. like in in that schematic. But we always know it as gain, and you'll always see the knob as gain on you know on different devices. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll see it as trim. Most often you see it as gain. Uh, I'm just typing in here those notes to kind of catch up on where we were. AES EBU digital pro level protocol. It's two channels, one way, uses XLR cable. XLR is a balance, your general balance cable design for mics. Unbalanced uh, TS is unbalanced uh, cable designed for instruments. TRS is balanced cable designed to transmit line level. And that's actually an interesting thing. The reason why, if I said, hey, I need you to plug in this keyboard, like this keyboard, the motif, I need to plug this keyboard into a mixer, what kind of cable are you going to use? It's going to be one of the quarter inch ones. Which kind would it be? Balance Y. Huh? Okay, but, but the real kicker reason is it has its own onboard preamp for its sounds, and it has its own output volume, which means it transmits at what level? Mic or line? Say it again? Line. line, right? So like when I determine, oh, this is a line level device, what should I use? TRS, right, balanced. Uh, if it was an instrument level device, then you, could, then you have a, a, you know, then you might say, oh yeah, we can get away with the TS. But yeah, I mean ultimately to reduce noise, you know. What are transducers again? Taking it back old school to day one. Yeah, essentially, yeah, they they convert Oops. acoustic energy to electric.
Okay, so uh, in analog tape recorders, the tape head order, just remember this is actually on the midterm, tape head order is erase, record, play. And it remember that it, it, it flows from left to right. So when the device plays, it plays from left to right. And it could actually, there are some uh, analog tape recorders that are designed to play the other direction, so that if you record in one direction, you could record in one direction, and then you could reverse direction, and and be able to record in another direction. Um, but essentially the, the standard setup is erase, record, play. Remember that that's important because if you don't erase it, you can't record on a blank piece of medium, and then of course play would go last, right? So that's how the head order goes. 30 IPS is pro level, 15 IPS is the consumer level. Those are tape speeds in what? IPS is what? Do you remember? Anybody remember? IPS is inches per second. 30 inches per second, 15 inches per second. So uh, just because essentially if it's moving at a, essentially that 30 inches per second, that faster tape speed, it's going to stretch the, re the, uh, the information across a longer span. So you get a, a higher resolution. Uh, preamps, uh, the big thing is you need to know what a preamp includes. Preamps include the following items. Gain. What else? Uh, no, that's beyond the preamp level. That's okay. Gain, what else? Some, there is something EQ kind of. Hmm? Pad. What's the pad? What is pad? It's negative attenuation. I'll put negative 20 because that's a standard pad. You know, it's negative attenuation in case the preamp level is coming in too hot. We don't have any uh, any room or range with the volume knob. What else? A lot of times, phase inversion. One other big thing. Filter. Uh, I'll I'll put um, high pass filter. The filter just rolls off, rolls off any of that low end. Now, there's a mixer solo button and a mixer mute button. What, what do you think those are? Okay, so one channel or select group of channels. Are, are turned on and all others are turned off. The mixer mute button essentially turns off a channel. Yeah, yeah, essentially it's you, you hit solo and it shuts them all off except for the channel. Okay. Now there's a couple of different modern modes of solo. So like there's there's a couple of solo options that, uh, that you'll hear solo in place or solo latch. Or, you know, there's a lot of uh, kind of modified solo versions. In the live performance arena, you can actually set up things to be soloed so that they only solo for monitoring, but they don't solo for the, the house system so that you can solo it as an engineer when you're working to figure out what's going on with it or work you know work on it or fine tune it but it doesn't kill it in the house so it's kind of nice um if you have an extra set of monitors that's so that's, there's that option too in the modern kind of creation of how they use solo headroom again was the level between nominal and distortion The pad is a negative attenuation to allow for more headroom at the preamp. Wait, did I put preamp twice? Oh, I did. Well, that's good and gone.
Now, there's only a couple other things I think that we haven't done. Proximity effect, the Fletcher-Munson curve, and adding decibels. What's proximity effect? Uh, the closer you get, the like, more volume that you have. Okay. So essentially, it's within six inches close source. Oops. Generates. More low end. I'm going to jump to adding decibels at the very end of the list, and I'll jump back to this flincher runs in the curve. Oh, I forgot. I don't know if I put it in here. Did I not? Oh, it is down here. It's way at the end. Sorry. So, do you do you guys remember what the average was? If we added two two, uh, if we if I said, hey, I have an eighty dB sound source, and I add another eighty dB sound source, almost three. three. When I combine them, instead of having one hundred and sixty decibels. The mathematic equation using the logarithm, logarithmic scale, which we talked about logs that one day in the 20 log system, it's a huge calculation that really comes down to about an average of three decibels and change. Uh, and so it's, it's really important for you to know that because um, what happens is, is if you set your master output so that the final output of a single channel source was at a nominal level, and then you introduced a copy of it or, or something else around the same source level, the master output will actually lose three decibels of headroom, which means the master output then has to be turned down. So like the more stuff you put in a session, the more you have to keep bringing your master down because otherwise it would distort. You know, we take 20 tracks around the same range, you, multi, you, know, you, you take them all together, you add them all up, you get 20 times three, which is how much? 20 times three? Yeah, you get 60 decibels added to whatever that range was, which ends up being too much for the output, so you have to keep bumping your master fader down. Uh, the Fletcher-Munson curve, oh, I'm sorry. I'm gonna, I forgot to put that in. Average three decibels. The Fletcher-Munson curve. I don't know, do you guys remember reading about this? I don't know if we have, did we talk about it? I think. And we did talk about it. Oh, we did, okay, so the Fletcher-Munson curve. Also known as the equal loudness curve. Which eventually really just states at low levels, our ears, uh, our ears, let's just say, are more focused. on mid frequencies while at high levels low end and high end even out with mid frequencies essentially what it, what it'll do is like when you turn things down low end is lost high end is high end clarity is lost as you turn it up they begin to level, they all level out. Problem with that is that it generates a weird unevenness when you're taking your volumes, when you're mixing. You turn them up, turn them down, and turn them up, and turn them down. And so it's important to keep track of that. The nominal level for someone to mix at for a duration of time typically is about 85 decibels. And that allows for it to be loud enough to offset the Fletcher-Munson curve, you know, and essentially level out. Um, and it allows the listener to listen for long periods of time. Uh, that's pretty much it, except I forgot to mention block diagrams will be on here. I'm trying to remember where I put them. They do exist, and we did talk about them. I just forget which week that was. Is this the, I have a block diagram right here. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, hold on to that. 
I'm just going to cycle through this real quick. It might take a good 30 seconds for it to do. I don't know why it does this transition where it dims, but it takes forever to do it. And then it, yeah, we're almost there, almost there, almost there. Good job. Okay. Remembering that the block diagram shows major components on a broad scale. Just, just showing components shows the routing flow. What's the importance of a block diagram to you in the first place? Like, why isn't it? Why is a block diagram like pertinent? Why do you have to have it? Okay. Well, yeah. So you can you know what your abilities would be with that particular device. Clarifies the function of the device. You know. Um, we talked about the basic components that are listed. The arrows indicate the direction. The triangle represents some sort of amplifier. Uh, there's an XLR in, uh, input and then the quarter inch. It's interesting because that XLR shows the front face of the jack, but that quarter inch actually shows the profile of when I open that one up and I pull that sleeve down, that's what that profile will look like essentially on, on the opposite end, on the receiving end. I don't know if I have Oh, I don't know if, oh, those are, I think those are encapsulated. I don't know if I could get into one of those. Um, and then we have the pot or the volume knob, a switch, and a fader. Notice the switch and the fader very much alike. Or not switch, I mean the pot and the fader. Round symbol means it's a knob. The rectangle means it's a fader. This is a switch. So if we look at this particular diagram here, we could see that the pad is a device that's switchable to 26 decibels, which is our switch option here. We also realize that the, the actual amp that supplies power uh, volume to the gain has what kind of thing? What is this? Circle with an arrow through it. What is it? What is that? What is it? <laughs> it's a volume knob, right? So a, a potentiometer, essentially a pot, it's just a volume knob. It's a scientific name for, or the official name for a volume knob. What's underneath the volume knob? The device that actually is doing the controlling. So this right here is your gain knob. <laughs> Rotary, okay? Uh, this is specific because it's AD conversion, which was analog to digital. Uh, this is your phase inversion symbol. If I were to say, okay, let's take a look at this. Does the meter, there's a meter option up here, up above, over here. Does the meter itself uh, happen before or after the EQ? Let me zoom in if this helps you. Here's the meter, before or after the EQ. Who says after, hands? Who says before? Why? So what happens is, is that actually, if you follow the signal line, it breaks off over here. And the reason it shows it over here is because it technically is set to start before the EQ. But there's an option for metering if you activate dynamics metering comes post dynamics and if you switch it to this delay path it has another option right here kind of confusing huh but you kind of have to follow these paths now here's a big question what happens when I send this signal to bus 1 Here's the bus output paths. What happens when I send the signal to bus one? How's it going to be represented in the panner, in panning? Left. And we know that because the pan has two sides, left and right. And one is only on left. It's not on both. Two is on right. Three is on left. Four is on right. Pretty simple, right? Okay. Yeah, I mean, as long as you're understanding how to read these, I think in the exam question, it's, it shows you a couple of them, and it just asks us a question about what the difference is between them. You know. 
Do you survive? <laughs> Any questions? Um, what is the test? Like, is it like my normal tool choice? How many questions are on it? Actually, I think I changed, uh, because of our conversation about the chapter that we omitted, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, actually you can. All right. 